that we'll FaceTime every day for like five hours, and she's like, Dad. Um, no, but I, I so appreciate what Drew said uh, regarding um, Europe. Um, my friend, a friend of mine and I were talking the other day, I think Monday, and he was just over in Europe, in Germany, and, and uh, Spain and stuff, and he was just echoing a lot of the same things that Drew said, just, you know, just that the, the coldness and just the, the lack of lack of hunger for God and it's a shame because Germany has such a rich or Europe has such a rich history I mean all of us most of us you know are the faith that we that we have was came because of people because of Europeans coming to the nation you know to the nations I um, you know the Kessler family came from um, Salzburg which is you know kind of Germany Austria as part of the Reformation we were we were uh, we were persecuted back in the 1750s because of our faith. We would not convert to Catholicism. And because of that, we were excommunicated from the country. And so we had to find, um, we had to find a place to, to live. And so we petitioned King George of England, and he got in touch with, I think, Oglethorpe and said, oh, you can come to Georgia. And so that's how we got here. Pretty cool story, but... You know, the reformers, there was such a, a deep history in God. But when you go back, when you go to Europe now, it's like there's hardly any of that. It's just dead, you know. And even think about, you know, in Revelation, the churches to Ephesus and the church, you know, they're not there anymore. You know, they died. And, and so, um, you know, this message, the purpose of this message is, is, is impacting, generate, is to impact the generations, many generations to come, and not just to our life would be in our little sphere, and then when we die, there's no fruit, there's no longevity. Um, it's raising up sons and daughters, right? Um, it's, it's being conformed into the image of Christ and then replicating that in others. Uh, you know, we have, we have this mindset, and it's easy to do, you know, we're waiting for the Lord to come, and we should be. And we, and, and, you know, but sometimes when we have that waiting, we also can get passive. And we can say, I'm just going to wait you know, for the Lord to return and just wait and not, and not do anything. And we need to wait. But waiting is not just being passive. Waiting is active. It's interesting in, you know, in the, um, the Olivet Discourse when you know, they're talking about the end of the age, uh, Jesus after he talks about, you know, the abomination of desolation and the, and the um, you know, the return, he was, he's talking about that day and he has two parables. One is the parable of the, of the virgins and then the other one's the parable of the talents. So there's, there's, it's a twofold thing. It's me and Jesus, right? That is probably the, that is the most important, right? That internal life, I think that's represented in the, in the, in the virgins, but also the talents in representing in, in our impact on this, on this world, right? Um, you know, and just to kind of set the context of the kingdom, you know, we're waiting for the kingdom to come. What does that mean, right? So if you look at like the Old Testament in the, um, you know, a lot of the Old Testament eschatology, which is, the, you know, the end times, they were waiting for the kingdom. And the, in the, you know, so many different prophecies in the Old Testament, is the kingdom was a physical kingdom, um, and when Jesus came, you know, he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? And we know when he returns, it's the culmination of that. Um, but we live in the, you know, you've heard the term the already but not yet. We're in that like tension age where it's the already. There's aspects of it, but it's, there's also the not yet. There's not the fullness of that. But I think the problem is we're living not enough in the, uh, in the already. The already is a lot more than, than we live in. And I think the Lord wants to change our mindsets so that there's, there's no ceiling to, to the level of Christ that we can have in us. There is no ceiling. There is no end to it. It's, it's related to our obedience and to our hunger. Um, and I want to, you know, if the Lord tarries another however many years, I want to be one who walks 
in the, in the powers, in the anointing of the age to come now. I don't want to wait. And we don't have to. God's, God doesn't want us to, right? He just wants people to be filled with his son and replicate that. And, and so, um, you know, when we look at the restoration process that the Lord has been doing over the last, you know, several thousand years, um, you know, it talks about in Malachi about the spirit and, and, you know, the power of Elijah is to restore the hearts of the fathers back to the children. And so the Lord is, is so much, and the family unit is, is God's primary vehicle for, for bringing restoration. And so um, the importance of being a parent, right, uh, to being a father, to being a mother, um, it's one of the highest callings that we can have, more than, more than anything. And most of us won't do anything extraordinary in this life. I mean, to be honest, we, we won't. Some of us will, but most of us will be just be ordinary, normal people. However, the highest calling we have is to be a parent. And, that's not, and I'm not speaking of natural either. I mean, natural is included, obviously, but it's also spiritual. Um, you know, this applies to everybody. It applies to those who have kids and those who don't, and those whose kids have, gr- have grown up. Um, God wants us to father and mother this generation. He wants to father and mother our own children, but also our spiritual children. Um, it's interesting, you know, the mandate that Adam and Eve were given in the garden was what? Is to be, to be fruitful and to multiply and to rule the earth, right? It wasn't just, hey, be fruitful and multiply. It's to rule the earth. Um, you know, in that, you know, the Lord said, let us make man into our image and let him rule, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a three-part component. We need to be in the image of Christ. We need to multiply and we need to rule, and so, if you look at in Matthew in the, you know, the Great Commission, he says, all authority, you know, the power, the rule has been given unto me, you know, Christ speaking, go and make disciples. It's like, it's the same thing, be fruitful, multiply. It's, it's being spiritual fathers, being spiritual mothers. It doesn't say, hey, go and make converts, right? Um, in that same conversation I was having with my friend, we were talking about how, uh, like, his, his brother's a missionary in uh, Southeast Asia, and a lot of people come over there, and they do these big crusades, and it's like, yeah, we had, you know, 400 million salvations or whatever, and it's like, you know, there's probably a few, and that's good. There, we should not minimize that. That is awesome. Um, but it's so much more than just throwing seed, and, you know, if you look at the, power, uh, the parable of the, of the, uh, of the soils, you know, it was the seed that took, that went into the soil that bore fruit. So it's not about this. I mean, again, the seed is the first step. Don't get me wrong, but it's about uh, fruit, right? Um, you know, so when we see, uh, you know, back going, you know, back to the, you know, the concept of, of discipleship and being a parent, it, it, it's, it's an investment. Like, if you're, if you go and you witness to somebody, it's okay, and that's good, we should do that. But being a, discipling someone is a commitment. It's a, and it could be a lifelong commitment. I mean, we look at, you know, uh, you know what's going on with life school. It's a lifelong commitment. Being a parent is a lifelong commitment. The, the ch- what I'm going through now with my children will be different than it is 10 years from now, and it's different now than it was 10 years before, right? But it's a commitment, you know, and the father, you know, we look at our own relationship with the Lord, you know, Jesus said, I am the vine, right? And you are the branch. You know, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit, right? The father is a vine dresser. What does a vine dresser do? It it directs and manages the progress, the, um, the intent of where the vine should go. And so, if it's bearing fruit, but it's still not enough to its potential, what does he do? He, he prunes that, right? And so that's, how the, that's what the Lord does in our hearts. So our job is to, be, is to abide in the vine and allow the sap you know, of his spirit to, to, to flow in us. But the fathers, he's putting us in situations to, to, to grow us, to bear more fruit. Um, he loves putting us in difficult situations so we'll grow and mature. And that's... You know, I think that's part of um, that's part of the walk. Is we, you know, he'll put us in these situations. 
Um, but the, the purpose is to gr- for us to grow, to us to grow into, into Christ. Um, and, in, you know, going back to the, uh, the mandate that was Adam and Eve were given, right, right afterwards, right, their face was a choice. They have, you know, the, we know the story, the knowledge of, uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And, you know, the Lord said on the day that you eat, if you, if you eat of this fruit on that day, you will die. Well, they didn't, they, they didn't die that day, but death entered in, right? It was, it was when that they, when they disobeyed, it was when death began to, to, to enter in. And so it was a 900, it was like 900 years or so later that, the culmination of that happened in the death of the body. And we see the exact, you know, we see the same thing in the new covenant is the Lord starts with the in, you know, the inward and the culmination of that. So we have life now in, in, in us. So Adam had death internally right after they sinned, but we have life, eternal life internally in the new covenant when we're born again. You know, Adam's death was culminated in his, the final death of his body. Our culmination will be in the new creation, where you know, when we get our resurrected bodies. Um, but but the, the 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 part of the restoration process of that is we see in, in you know, Genesis 15 that the um, that the Lord said, "I will put enmity between your seed and her seed," and so. Right then, Adam and Eve knew that there was going to be one who would come who would destroy the works of the enemy. And it's interesting, if you read the next chapter over, when Cain was born, you know, Eve says, hey, this is a man-child, like, meaning like, this is the one who is going to destroy the, the, the power of the enemy. And from generation to generation in the Old Testament, every male that was born, they thought, hey, could this be the one? Could this be the one? Um, and then we see that in, uh, in, in Samuel, too. You know, some of the translations, when it talks about Samuel, you know, a male child, it uses man-child, right? I think, I think every mom during that you know, time thought, hey, this could be the Messiah. Because it was, it was just as we are. We know that the Lord will return, and every believer knows that that's coming. They believed that, or they knew that there would one day come, from, born of a woman, a Messiah who would crush the head of the enemy. Um, and so, when we look, you know, going back to okay, what are what are we restoring? Well, let's see what the, the effects that you know that one decision had. Um, you know, it's all was rooted in self. Every sin, the ultimate root is, is self. Uh, you know, the first sin was I can become like God, right? It was, wait a second, I can, I don't have, I can do this. It was independence. I don't need to be yoked to the Lord. I can be, I can have this on my own. And so it was self, and as a result of self, we get what? We get immorality, right? And then as a result of immorality, we get fatherlessness. And as a result of fatherlessness, we get a destruction of our society. And you can see that, you know, we look at now, the number one problem we have in, in, um, in our nation, in this world, I think is fatherlessness. We have, you know, we don't have, we have children who are, who are being raised in, um, you know, without fathers. And, you know, a lot of us here may be victims of that. And again, there's no shame in that. It's just, it's just the reality of, um, of where we are. Uh, you know, so what did God do in order to combat sin, right? He, he, he established the law. And the law was not, in, the, the purpose of the law was not to, um, was not to deliver someone from sin. It was to say, hey, you want to be like God? You know, you ate of the fruit. You want to be like God? Well, this is what God's like. Be like God. And you're like, well, I can't, you know. It was man's attempt to be like God. Um, the problem is we cannot be like God. You know, we, have, we need the new creation. I mean, think about, like, 
humans, how many of us need to learn how to smell or taste? Or or Ben does, but besides Ben. But how many of us need to learn how to do these things? We don't. It's just natural. And, And so if I wasn't a human, if I was some alien that didn't have this, right, I would say, hey, you want to be like a human? You need to learn how to taste. Okay, well, what's taste? Well, this is what taste is. You need to learn how to smell. Well, what's smell? This is what smell is. And the same is true with us in relation to into, into the nature of God. It's like you are you are of this uh, of this creation, the old man, the creation of Adam, very different from the new creation, you know, the nature of God. And so God's like, this is what I'm like, but you can try to do that on your own, but you're not going to be able to. So how, the solution is the new creation, is where our nature becomes changed, is where we are, we are born again. And so, you know, when you see the, the seed of the Messiah coming, it was to what? This, I mean, there's many things, but, you know, it came to destroy. We heard, you know, we've heard the scripture, you know, Jesus came to destroy the works of, of the devil. In 1 John 3, 8, it says, whoever makes a practice of sinning, is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this reason, God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. And so we see right there that the not only was this man-child, this, uh, the seed of the woman, going to destroy the enemy, but it was going to destroy all the works of the enemy too, which is sin. And so we see that the effect of the new creation is to destroy sin. So going back to what we were talking about before, about you have, you know, in the kingdom, you know, we're all waiting when Jesus comes and finally restores all things, but his, the way he designed everything is, no, I'm going to first put my spirit in you, and that's going to, we're basically starting over, you know, from, you know, so Adam sinned, death reign, he's putting his life in us so that life will reign. And so when we're, um, you know, it lo- in, in the analogy of uh, the, you know, the, the sin being destroyed, you know, we've, we've, we've heard this, you know, the, the scripture, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke, right? And so we think of that as, you know, I'm going to get prayer and that's going to break the yoke. And that, that is true. That does that. But another way of saying that is, is the fatness. So some translations say it's the fatness that breaks the yoke and some think that, you know, it's the, it's the anointing. And both are true. Both are true. You know, as, um, you know, fatness speaks of growth, right? As I grow, you know, God put his seed in me, his spirit. But as that grows, what happens? the yokes begin to, to fall off, right? So there is the, and I've had many, and, and so have, you know, many of us here have, when we have those moments where the power of God is manifested and there is a, there is a deliverance, um, but it's more than that. I think it's more when we grow in Christ and that growth causes the, um, that growth causes the, the bondages to break. Um, in, in Romans 5.17, it says, for because of one man, so 17 through 19, uh, for it is because of one man's trespass that death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one man led to the condemnation of all men, so one act of righteousness leads to the justification of all men. For as one man's disobedient, many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. So we see the context is, is reigning in life, right? Is reigning in life. And so, you know, as we are working this out in our own life, this, this, again, this was talking about Adam and Christ, but it still applies to us, right? So, for example, if you have a family, let's say, where there's a history of some sin, right? And we know that the, the sins are passed down from generation to generation to generation. Well, let's say, um, let's say your father 
was in that sin, and now it's you're the next one in line. Well, you are you're you're standing against that and getting victory over whatever that sin is is making it easier and easier and easier for the generations after you. Um, you know, think of like divorce, like in marriage. Like if you have a history of divorce, then you want to be that one who we stop that, and so it doesn't it doesn't go on, right? So. Any, any sin that is passed down from generation to generation, then we want to be those who stop that from going on to further generations. And the same is true for, for righteousness, right? So if you have a, if, you're, um, if, you, if your parents had a deep history in God and love the Lord, then most, most likely you will too. And so we see the importance of, of being those who, no matter where we are, if we're, if we're, if we're of the camp that had no, uh, you know, Christian upbringing or a bad, a bad family or whatever, and we're, we're the ones who are that first generation, that's fine. It's going to be harder, right? But make it, make it a, a mandate to where you're not going to quit, you're not going to give up, because it's, you're affecting the generations and generations if the Lord tarries. Um, and the same is true if, if we've been blessed by, you know, godly, godly parents, then so much more, you know, we're picking up where they left off and we're growing more in Christ. And, and, and so you see, you see the importance of, of replicating this, of this multi-generational um, growing, you know, raising up sons and daughters. And so, but the purpose of it is reigning in life. Like, again, like we're in that already, but not yet. Like we are training for reigning. Like the Lord has mandated Every single one of us, like, our, the mandate we have for our life is reigning. And so we are, to, we are to do that here. We are to be overcomers. And the, to the level of, you know, that we overcome here, you know, God will give us, he'll give us the rewards in the age to come to be those who, um, to be those who work that out in, in, in you know, in greater, in greater levels. Um, and so... Then we look at, okay, so what is the goal then of, a parent, of, of being a parent of discipling, right? It's, it's first and foremost as we, you know, we're reproducing after our own kind. So if we are pursuing the Lord wholeheartedly and we're being conformed into his image, then we're reproducing that, right? Or if we're, if we're not, then we're reproducing, we're reproducing, um, you know, the bad, you know, our, our sin nature or, or, you know, you fill in the blank. Um, but as we're, you know, we're conformed in, to the image of Christ, we are to, we're, con, you know, we're, we are con, being conformed into that mature man is, um, it, it, the mature man, the, the mature nature of Christ is grown in us. And so we see in, you know, in Ephesians 4.11, and, you know, God gave leaders for the purpose of equipping the saints to reach to the fullness of stature, to the full mature maturity of Christ, right? To the fullness. Um, and so for you to be a leader in this, you can't lead someone into, okay, I'm, my goal is to grow Christ in you if you're not first um, walking in maturity. And so, you know, we have to love the Lord wholeheartedly wholeheartedly, and then we need to reproduce that in others. Um, you know, we need to love others well. We need to be generous. Um, you know, we need to be kind. Um, we need to teach our kids to do the same, right? So they're going to see us by our example, but, you know, we need to teach them to do these things. Uh, you know, we, Jeanette and I, have, when the kids were really little, we were, um, we would teach them about tithing, but they were too little to really understand it. But now they're, you know, they're starting to make money doing odd jobs. And so we're talking about tithing and um, it's hard. Tithing's hard. And I got to, I'll pick on Ellie because she's not here, but I got into a discussion with Ellie a few weeks ago and she's like, dad, it's, it's, it's so, di it's so much easier when you're an adult because I mean, let's say I have, you know, $250. I got to give $25. That is a lot of money. I mean, it's like if you make, let's say, $2,000, it's, 
you get you just got to give 200 and so you have like you still have $1800 and I was like oh child you don't know anything and I'm like let me tell you and she's like dad stop and I'm like no I'm going to tell you I was like I'm like okay you got 2000 but you got to pay taxes and you got to pay federal tax state tax medicare social security so that's now let's say 1300 and you got to pay insurance and you got to invest for retirement. So now, let's say you have, let's say you have 1,100 or 1,000, and then you got to do the 200 on top of that. So it's like, it's as easy as it's going to be for right now for you. It's not going to get any any easier. And I'm like, you need to get into the mentality now because it's going to be hard when you become an adult and you have, you know, more responsibilities. And she's just like, you know, whatever. I'm like, okay, just just wait. Um, but you know. My, my parents taught us that. I remember when I was, you know, in elementary school, we got an allowance and it was like, you know, and so my dad did it and so I learned to do that. I learned from the, as a child and, you know, being, being one who is generous with their, with their finances and, and being disciplined about it. Like, again, like, um, it's not a religious thing. It's just being being disciplined about tithing, and you know the Lord has blessed. He, the Lord will bless that. He will bless it. He will um, again. It's it's sowing seed. It's it's uh, it's being generous, and the Lord honors that. And so um, you know we also need to teach our kids. How, you know, to reign, to reign in life. What's the perp- The reigning in life is not so we can, you know, look at me. It's to, it's the betterment of society, right? So the, you know, Jesus, he wants to undo the effects of sin, and we see it in our society. And so, as we become those who um, who are filled with the Lord, then we replicate that and uh, and so it's for it's for it's not for ourselves i mean granted we benefit from it right um but it's for others and so you know to reign in life we need to learn to walk in wisdom we need to teach our children how to do that um we need to walk in integrity we you know this is not a spiritual thing but it's very important we need to be those who who work incredibly hard and, and have a spirit of excellence in everything that we do. We need to be those who are skilled, you know? Like, we need to, um, you know, be those who, raise, who, can, who can provide for our family. Um, you know, there's gonna come a point in time where kids can't, don't depend on their parents anymore, but they need to be able to, they need to be able to function in society. And so our job as a parent is to make sure like spiritually, they can survive out there, but also, you know, practically too, right? They need to. They need an education. They need to be able to, you know, read and write and, and do math. And um, you know, they need a skill. They need to be able to, to, uh, to, to work and to get a job and to and to work hard. You know, like. Hard work in a culture of excellence is something that is disappearing in our culture. And um, it's probably one of my biggest pet peeves that I have when I see that in people where they don't work hard or they don't have that culture of excellence. So you want to make a difference? Those are two very easy things that you can do. It's like, be, just be someone who works hard and and has a spirit of excellence. But we have to instill that into our children. And, you know, I love seeing Evan and Ellie. Like they're, uh, they've been doing a lot of work for people. Not a lot, but some. You know, they'll, they'll do for um, my parents and then some neighbors. But they they work really hard. And Angie texted Jeanette and I yesterday that Evan, and Ellie, and Anna uh, did some work for one of their neighbors, and they were just amazed at their work ethic and how well they they listened to instructions, and they just did such an amazing job. And I'm like, this is awesome because like. I'm, you know, we are preparing them to be functioning human or functioning adults, you know, and they're, yes, they are, they are strong willed and, and, you know, but that's good. Right. And so we want, we want to grow them so that they can be bear much fruit. Right. Um, 
and so, you know, we don't want to be short-sighted. We want to be, we want to be very intentional about, about raising up the next generation. Um, it's, you know, we need to think if the Lord tarries, my great, 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 great grandson, I want him to be more on fire and, and walk in more than, than I have. And that should be my goal and that should be my intention. And if it's a spiritual son, the same thing, right? I mean, it, this applies both to natural and spiritual. Um, and so, you know, the, just because I'm, and most of us are very, or, we're not going to do anything big, right? We're just going to be ordinary people. But someone in our, lo- our lineage could. I mean, like, how many of you know who Lamech is? Raise your hand, besides Randall. I'm sure Randall probably does. But who is Lamech? Anyone? you never heard of Lamech? I mean, come on. you never heard of Lamech? What's that? That's right. Well, Jude, okay, Jude, star student over here. Yes, the father of Noah, right? So he's, no one has heard of him except for Judy, right? And so he is the father of Noah, right? But he came from a line, like his, his dad was Methuselah. Methuselah was the oldest person to, that we know of to live. And his Methuselah's dad was Enoch. And we know the story of Enoch. He walked with God and was no more. Like the, he walked so closely with the Lord. So we see the history that Noah came out of. And so everybody knows Noah. Every, every, pretty much every, every, every non-believer, people know about Noah. But the history that he had because of his family, right? They're in a culture of complete darkness and, and evil and you know, God raised him up, and a big part of that was because of his family. What about Mathan? Anyone know Mathan? You know, anybody? No? Rice does, no? No? Maybe a name for a child, right? No, I'm just kidding. Maybe a, a, the feminine version. Uh, that was Joseph's grandfather. I didn't say Jacob, because like, there's like a thousand Jacobs, right? But Joseph, you know, the... the uh, earthly father of Christ, his, you know, think about when Jesus, or the father, was trying to figure out who is going to be a good father to raise my son. He chose Joseph. Well, Joseph was probably a good person and had good qualities and good characters because of his family, you know. Um, And so, Again, like, you know, I'm sure, you know, Mathan is hanging out one day. is like, I'm just normal, whatever. Well, didn't know that his grandson would be the earthly father of, of Christ. And then, you know, Amos. Who's Amos? It's Isaiah's father. And so you see, you see the importance of being a parent. And just because our impact may be incredibly small and... Um, you know, we may think like, oh, we're just, we're just raising children. I'm sure, you know, moms feel this all the time. Like, we're just, you know, my impact is my kids, right? And, but if your kids be, ha, impact others, right? And, you know, again, th- the scripture about through many, one's man's obedience, many were made righteous. That's, that's the, the family unit. If I, if I take, if I do the hard things as a parent, or as a, you know, a spiritual parent, if I do the hard things and really, really, like, not be selfish and, and you know, sacrifice, then this can lead to a multi-generational, um, you know, multi-generational impact. And I know, you know, when Jeanette and I had kids, we had these great intentions like, oh, our kids are going to be, you know, prophets to the nations and, you know, we're like going through names. We're like, all oh, these biblical names. And, and we had, you know, these good intentions. And, you know, I think we're like, oh, we're going to be the best parents. And, you know, we all, we all fall short, right? Um, I know if you look at new parents, they're, you know, maybe not their, their second one, but, you know, their first one, it's like, oh, we're going to, you know, the name, they're going to be this prophet to the nations. And they may be, you know. Most likely, they'll just, you know, be 
like us. And, and then there again, there's there's a, there's a there's a uh, there's exceptions, right? Obviously, we see that, um, but that doesn't change. We need we need to parent our children as they as, as though that they will be used by God in, in a very powerful way. Um, you know, but soon after we, we have children, we realize the sin nature, right? And you say, like, oh, wow. Like, um, you know, that's definitely, that's definitely, you know, these kids do have a sin nature. And so, you know, as we are being parents and we're trying to raise our children in, in this culture and, you know, to, to be um, conformed into his image, we will soon find how we need to be conformed to, right? Um, you know, being a parent will, will stretch you and it will, um, it, the process of it, it will be conformed into the image of Christ as part of that. Um, you know, the, uh, we're going to, you know, walking out the Sermon on the Mount, you know, that's something that is, when you read it, it's, man, this is very hard to do. And, um, you know, I have, you know, our kids are, are very, very strong-willed kids. And, um, you know, I'm, but I'm, I'm strong-willed as well. You know, Jeanette's strong-willed. We're strong-willed people. And, you know, da- my dad, when he describes my relationship with my daughter, he says, it's an irresistible force comes in contact with an immovable object, right? So, like, Ellie is, she's a jackhammer. She's just like... But I don't budge. I don't move most of the time. Sometimes I do. Um, you know. So the but in that the Lord's preparing us. The Lord is preparing us to uh, to be not only to raise our children, but He's He's preparing. He's He's conforming us into His image too. And so the world needs strong-willed people who have backbones of steel, but whose hearts are for the Lord and who walk in integrity and who walk in in holiness, um, you know, but you're, we're going to find quickly that we, we fall short. We get, you know, we get mad. We, um, you know, we, we have flesh too. Like, so we're not perfect. We're going to fail. Um, you know, but we have fun with it. We do like, we can, we come up with names for each other sometimes. And I, I probably have most of the names. Uh, I mean, you know, sometimes I can be strict. And uh, I don't think I'm being strict, you know, but I could have, a, you know, raise my voice. They're like, oh, you're having a tone, you know. I'm like, I don't feel like I'm having a tone. And then I can't remember who came out with a name. It may have been Jeanette or maybe an Ellie. You're like, you have a tone. Oh, you're Tony. And you're strict. Oh, you're Tony Strickland. That's your new name. I'm like, I'm Tony Strickland. I'm, I have a tone and I'm strict. And so where it becomes funny is if I'm doing it, they're like, Tony Strickland, stop. And so, in a funny way, I'm like, okay, um, you know. So we have fun with it, you know. But we don't, we don't, uh, you know, we don't quit, and we don't. Uh, we, but we realize we're gonna fall short, um, you know. Let's see. You know, again, but, but we have to be real. Like, I don't want, you know, this this like fake. Like, you know, we've seen, like, the pictures, this religious uh, family over here. They're, like, you know, shiny, happy people, la, la, la. But inwardly, they're, they're, they're a mess. And, no, we're real, right? We want to be real. We want to be, um, we want to be those who are, um, we want to be those who are, are real but are, but are full of life, Right. Um, has anyone seen, you know, Brian talked about that documentary, Shiny Happy People. Has anyone seen, seen that? Yeah. Um, you know, that is, you know, we, we, I watched it a few weeks ago, and it's like I wanted to scream and, and, to, and to yell, you know, just that you had a, um, you had a, a, a movement. And we were, I mean, I remember... Um, when I was little, like the Bill Gothard movie. Does anybody know who Bill Gothard is? So Bill Gothard was a, he was a teacher. He still is. I mean, he's, he's old. He's in his late, he, I don't know how old he is, but he's, I thought he was old when I was like in elementary school. So I'm sure he's, he's, he's really old now. 
Um, but I remember we would go to, to these seminars and um, I, I loved them because we got to go to the food court and eat afterwards. And so, um, but I remember we go to the Omni and there were 15 or 20,000 people. And I guess it was like their entry level one. And if people went on to the next one, then they were enrolled into like, I guess we call it like the advanced training or whatever. Um, and I remember, I didn't know then, but my dad and I were talking about it a few weeks ago and he was saying oh, he, he couldn't stand it. It was just like very legalistic and, um, you know, just very much like trying to enforce like morality and Christ likeness externally, right? It doesn't work that way. You can't, you can't do it that way. And so, um, he was like, yeah, we're not, we're not doing this. Um, and we never went back. Now I'm looking at, I'm like, man, I am so thankful we, we did not do that. And so this, you know, this story, this shiny happy people is about the Dugers. They have like 19 kids um, and they're very much in that kind of like Bill Gothard type uh, movement and it's very external. It's, you know, like uh, everything they do is all, it's, it's very external. Um, and they had in this in this uh, documentary, they had a lot of people on there who were, um, I guess, victim I don't know, vict victims or they were part of this movement. And they were had they were you know there's a lot of abuse um, and a lot of like trauma that came from it. It was just basically just a lot of outward rules that created um, it just no life, no love, um, and it fostered, it fostered a culture of abuse. And so I, I really think that um, that movement is really what has, has kind of launched progressive Christianity because people, you know, you, when you try to take, okay, we want to conform you to Christ, but do it according to the flesh, it doesn't work. I mean, Paul says that in Galatians. It's like, wait, you begun by the Spirit, if why you've begun by the Spirit, why are you trying to be perfected by the flesh? You know, he was talking about, you know, the law. He's like, no, you begin by the Spirit and you're perfected by the Spirit. The law is just there to point out sin. It does not change you. And so if we try to outwardly conform to, to these things, we're not going to do that. It's not going to work. Uh, and in Romans 7, you know, Paul's given the analogy of, of marriage as it relations to us in the law. And he said, you know, if you're married to someone, you're, you, are, you are bound to them until, until death. But as soon as they die, you are free. And he, and, and, and he basically makes a co comparison to us in the law. So, like, we are, we are, we were married to the law, Right but we have died to the law through the body of Christ. So in verse 4, Romans 7, 4, it says, Therefore, my brethren, also you are made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you may be joined um, to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in, in the members of our body to bear fruit for death, so that we have been released from the law, having died to that which, which we were bound, so that we will serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of letter. And so we see here, you know, the law, its intent is to point out, but it's not to change. But, you know, Paul's basically describing here, it's like, I can't change, I can't change. I'm bound to this. I'm bound to this law. But through the body of Christ, I have died to that, so that I may, bear, I may bear fruit. So you cannot bear fruit unless we are joined with Christ. Trying to not sin or to do this, to do that, is not going to bear fruit. We only bear fruit if we are in union with Christ. Um, you know, the law came because of sin. We see in, in, in Galatians 3.19, why the law? It was because of transgressions. First Timothy says, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully realizing that the law is not made for the righteous person, but for those who are lawless. And so um, the purpose of it is for the lawless. 
It is the tutor to lead us to Christ. And so when that word tutor, we know we've heard of, you know, many times in, in, about, it's talking about adoption um, and not adoption that, as we know adoption. It's, you know, the Greco-Roman adoption. And just to review, if I was a, let's say, a wealthy landowner, but I didn't have any, any, any children, I would, I would find a child and, and there would be guardians and managers that would train them. And once they, you know, kind of um, shown that they could uh, take the inheritance, they would receive the adoption into uh, that inheritance. And so when, when Paul's making the analogy how the law is our tutor that leads us to Christ and that we have been adopted, um, it's the inheritance that it's talking about here is, is the, you know, the inheritance of the blessing of Abraham. It's the Holy Spirit. Um, later on in Romans, he talks about another adoption, and that is the adoption into the inheritance of Christ. And so the inheritance of Christ we see is in you know in Psalms two, I will give you the nations as as your inheritance, and you will you will um, you will rule them with a rod of iron, right? And so we see you know the first the first inheritance we have is through the is the Holy Spirit, and how the law was there before the Holy Spirit came, right? And it was the it was the tutor to lead us to Christ. It was because of it was because of sin that it was there. But now that Christ came, we now have that law inside of us. And so the next adoption we're looking for is the redemption of our body, right? It's the, manif it's the manifestation of the sons of God. And we, you know, we get that from walking in the Spirit. And through the walking of the Spirit, we begin to grow and to mature. And so you know, in, this, in this life, we are, we are training for reigning. And so... When we look at that and how the Lord is our is our tutor, the Holy Spirit is our tutor um, now, and how we're we're walking in the Spirit, we need to replicate that in our families. We need to replicate that in our children, um, and we need to replicate that in our in our spiritual children. In First Corinthians four fourteen through sixteen, it says, "You know, I admonish you." Um, as my beloved children, you have had countless teachers or tutors in Christ, um, but not many fathers. For you in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I exhort you to be imitators of me. Okay, so a teacher, a father is a teacher, a mother is a teacher, but not all teachers are fathers or mothers. And so a, a father is one who, there's, there's ownership, ownership, longevity, and it's not, I don't want to just show you and teach you what to do, right? I want to show you what to do. It's one thing, like I learned from example, like you can tell me how to do something, but if you show me, I'm going to learn it. And so as parents, we have to be those who show. And so our kids can learn, you know, our bad, obviously we don't want them to learn our, our, our bad stuff, but we want to, we want them to, to, um, we want them to love the Lord wholeheartedly, and they're going to get that from us. And so if we're not pursuing the Lord wholeheartedly, our kids may not, right? So if we are pursuing the Lord wholeheartedly, there's a good chance our kids will too. Um, you know, so like, you know, looking back at our family, like we didn't grow up having family devotions. I know I think we tried, and it was like, it was, didn't do anything. We, it was just, a, you know it didn't really last if we did. And I know Jeanette and I have tried and we tried even like a few months ago and we're like, Hey, we're going to do this at dinner. And Evan or Ellie's like, we're not, we're going to do it one time and we will never do it again. And we did it twice, I think. Um, you know, but my parents, when I look at my, they're, they're perfect models of what I want. And, you know, and, and us, ra you know, Jeanette and I raising our children, I want to be, you know, like them. And, and so when I look at, like, what did they do, um, you know, they taught us the Lord, to love the Lord wholeheartedly. They taught us the value of seeking the Lord daily uh, and, then, and the importance of prayer. It wasn't like, okay, Michael, Brian, Jonathan, and Stephen, you need to love the Lord wholeheartedly. You need to pray. No, they, they did it. Like, I remember any time I would wake up, before, or after they were awake, I would go downstairs. My dad would be seeking the Lord. My mom would be, 
And they did that day after day. I mean, obviously, I'm sure they, they, they could miss days, um, but they prayed too. And, um, you know, they, we had a lot of talks around dinner where it wasn't, hey, today we're going to talk about this. It was just spontaneous. And so, um, you know, it's, but it's not just hunger, it's prayer too, it's both. And, and so, if we want to have a lasting impact on our, in this world, we need to invest into our children, um, both natural and spiritual. And if we, and if we want to invest in our children, we need to invest in our own spiritual life. Like we're going to reproduce what's in us. If we don't have, um, if we're not pursuing the Lord wholeheartedly. And again, when I say pursuing the Lord wholeheartedly, everybody has different situations. Um, you may not have the ability to spend hours a day before the Lord. Um, and that's fine. That's, you can still pursue the Lord wholeheartedly without doing that. I remember, you know, before we start, I started working from home, like I didn't have the, there is no way I could spend a lot of time Monday through Friday with the Lord. I, I just couldn't do it. It was impossible because of my work schedule. I had to leave the house at, um, you know, six o'clock, six fifteen in the morning. And it's like, I tried a few times getting up at like four thirty. that lasted once, you know, like it's just impossible. But my heart was always thinking about the Lord. I was, you know, as I'm working, I'm thinking about him. I'm meditating on him. Um, I would listen to things on the, in the car, right? And then on the weekends, I would have, you know, those times with the Lord. Well, now, because I work from home, thanks to COVID, I have a lot more time. And so if you, you know, it's very hard for moms, too, with, with children. I mean... Um, you know, so this is not to get, you know, anyone into condemnation or anything like that. Um, and if your heart is to do it, that's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And, and as we begin to pursue that, um, the Lord will, as we begin to, you know, back to the anointing breaks the yoke. We, as we get fat, as we begin to eat and eat, it'll get, we'll get more strength. And so, um, you know, as we, as we do that ourselves, you know, we should, you know, especially um, for husbands and wives, we need to pray for our, um, for our families. Uh, I know we don't always do that every day. Um, you know, we have a desire to. Um, we may do it individually, but, you know, t together we may not. But that should be something, that should be a goal that we have. Um, I know it's a goal that we have. We just, again, like, this is not about being, um, you know, rigid and religious about it. It's just, it's, it's being motivated by hunger. Um, you know, some practical things, you know, develop a devotional life, be hungry, have regular quiet times. Again, everyone has a different schedule. You know, pray with, pray with your spouse, um, pray with your, pray for your kids, pray with your kids. Um, have conversations with your kids about the Lord. I remember, I mean, Evan and I still do, but I know when he was little, um, we would have, I mean, he was probably like six, and he's like learning like deep theology about the end times. You know, like, this, this is cool. Like, he's going to be like talking to his teacher and be like, hey, and his teacher would be like, what are you talking about? But I was like, he was hungry, and you know, it was awesome. We're talking about these things. Um, and I see it, you know, teaching the kids now, like, the depth that they have. Um, you know, I know Evan went to a Bible study with Ben the other day, and Evan was telling me about, they were talking about, I think, Romans, Romans 1. And, like, Ben, he was, tell, he was talking about what Ben, like, Ben started talking about the inward life. And I'm like, I could just see if like some of the adults were there, you know, just being like, just the wisdom that's coming, you know, from Ben, and you know, Ben's receiving that from Drew and Bethany, from you know, from going through the the teaching that we do, um, you know. So we see we see that we see the the fruits of that. Um, go to church every week, like, you know, like I think. When I was growing up, we went to church every Sunday. Guess what? We've, we do that in our family too. Um, 
you know, go to prayer, go to house church, model repentance. Like, you know, we're going to screw up. Like, it's, and when we do, we, we have a conversation with our children about it. Like, hey, you know, sorry for being, you know, mad. I apologize. I, you know, shouldn't have done that. And, and be real. Like, that's the thing. It's like, be hungry, love God, and be, just be real. Um, and model holiness. Like, if, there, if, we're in a, if we're in a situation of compromise, let's say, let's say in the area of integrity of like, um, you know, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but show, show character, like, or, you know, like be, be those who, who walk in, in character, um, you know, walk in the fruit of the spirit, um, integrity, humility. But then, you know, I think we also need ambition. We need to teach our kids to work hard, um, you know, godly and righteous ambition is a good thing. We need to be generous. Um, you know, and I think as they get older, this next one I think is harder. Is like we we need to, they need to learn, they need to learn to fail, right? They need to learn to, um, like, I don't want the worst thing that can happen is when kids get older, when they reach that age, say 18 or 19, and they just want to leave, and they leave, and they don't want anything to do with it. And that happened, like that whole, like shiny happy people. Bill Gothard movement. I think that's what happens a lot. It's like I want nothing to do with that, and they leave. And you know, I want my kids to experience enough of the world—not a lot of it, but enough of it—to realize there's nothing there, right? Um, you know, you think of like a vaccine. The, vac- the purpose of a vaccine is to just just get a little bit to where it doesn't affect you, hopefully, and it you have an immunity towards it, right? And so I think that's a, you know, that's a good analogy for um, the um, allowing our kids to experience enough of the world to where they get enough of it that they don't want it and they they want the Lord more. Because before you know it, they're going to be on their own. And so they're going to have to make their own decisions. And so they're going to be tempted with these things. Eventually, they're going to be tempted with these things. And so we want, why we still have them on the leash, like, we, we can extend the leash a little bit so that when they do grow up and leave, that they are still pursuing the Lord wholeheartedly. Um, you know, and I think also, too, we need to have fun. You know, we need to play with our, our children. We need to have fun. Um, we need to be loving and affectionate. Um, you know, pr- I'm probably too too affectionate, and I always will be. I mean, I will be till the day they die. I'm just an affectionate person. Um, I probably drive drive them crazy, but too bad. Um, and then, you know, have a sense of humor. T- tell dad jokes. I'm the king of dad jokes. Uh, Brian says they're granddad jokes because they're so bad. Um, no, but in all seriousness, like we uh, we only have one life, and our life's gonna. I mean, it goes by fast, right? And if the Lord tarries, you know, I want to. I want my life to have meaning. I want to have multi generational meaning, um, and the uh, you know, I want to be. I want to be a father who will replicate what God has done in me and to my children. Um, and again, there's personal responsibility there, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's hunger. So it, it starts, you know, it starts with the parents. Um, and I think the, the father is, and not to minimize, you know, uh, you know, the mom, but the father, men, it, it, a big part of this is you, is us. It's, it's being the leader in the home. It's modeling these things. It's modeling, um, you know, love. It's modeling uh, hunger. It's modeling hard work. It's modeling, um, you know, being the spiritual leader of, of your home. And, um, you know, I think if we, if, we, if we pursue that wholeheartedly, then I think the Lord, the Lord will... will We'll begin again. The the, the anointing the, as we grow in that, we'll be replicating that in our in our own homes. 
And so, um, you know, in closing, you know, I just want us to, um, you know, to, especially for all the, whether you're a father or not, uh, and mothers too, but especially the fathers, is to, is to really make a commitment before the Lord that says, I am going to, I'm going to be like Lamech or, you know, these people that never, no one ever knew about, but I'm going to, I'm going to raise my child in a way that um, they're going to be functioning adults and they're going to bear up much fruit, right? Uh, and moms too. Like we, you know, with the, um, I think with the, with the, uh, you know, the, the, where, where we're going as a, as a nation and then, I think there's going to be a lot of people coming into to the faith. Um, he's calling a lot of us to disciple and to raise up to raise up kids, and to or kids in the in the Lord, uh, you know, spiritual kids. And so we have a mandate to to parent this next generation. And so, you know, I want all of us to do it wholeheartedly. And so, um, I guess Doug, you can go ahead and stop the uh, YouTube. Is this Stan? Well, Lord, we, 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 do, we do say, God, that we want, um, we want to be those who, who will not only love you wholeheartedly, um, but, God, we will be those who parent this next generation. Um, We, I just, especially for for the, uh, I want to I want to pray um, for the uh, for those who are married, who don't have children yet or children on the way. Um, we want to pray for for those. So I guess if you are, if you want it, um, if you're a father.